Okay. Well, let me uh, thank you all for being here and start with a quote. The need for another revolution should be obvious now to all those who are not willfully blind. It is not, I fear, probable, but without doubt it is possible. Now, this is not from one of the usual suspects. Uh, this is from Brian Berry, the Lieber Professor of Political Philosophy at Columbia, Professor of Political Science, London School of Economics. The closing words of his beautiful, angry book, Why Social Justice Matters, published in 2005. Barry died in 2009. He was also, uh, for an extended period of time, the, the editor of the most prominent uh, journal in moral philosophy, ethics, uh, when he was a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, these words were foreshadowed by the remarks in the book's preface. <clears throat> One thing can be stated with certainty, the continuation of the status quo is an ecological impossibility. The uncertainty lies with the consequences of this fact. It is quite in the cards that the response will be the further retrenchment of plutocracy within the countries and an ever more naked attempt by the United States, aided and abetted by a coalition of the willing to displace the costs onto poor countries. Whether it succeeds or fails, the results will be catastrophic. So, part one, ecological crisis, economic crisis. Barry's book was written before the global economic meltdown, which would suggest that things are even worse now, since addressing climate change and other ecological disasters requires money, and everyone, governments as well as private citizens, are strapped right now. Moreover, the current economic recession is not going to end, not unless there's a fundamental restructuring of the economic system. Let's remember the deep cause of the present crisis, about which the left economists have been far more perspicacious than their mainstream counterparts. Wages have been flat, productivity positive since the mid-1970s. So to keep up effective demand, the rich, i.e. the capitalist class, has been lending money to the rest of us to us individuals, individually as consumers, and to us collectively, i.e. to the governments, instead of raising wages and increasing their taxes. And there would seem to be no way out of the mess we are in. Globalization keeps downward pressure on wages, and there are no new technologies on hand that would create lots of new profitable enterprises that will create lots of new jobs. To the contrary, labor-saving technology now destroys more jobs than it creates. I think it wouldn't be wrong to say that capitalism's got, got a new lease on life in the 20th century following the Great Depression by accident. Uh, not only did World War II pull us out of the global crisis that seemed to have confirmed Marx's predictions, uh, but the new transformative technologies that were spreading everywhere, above all those associated with the automobile, created vastly more jobs than they destroyed. I mean, just think not only the, the, the automobile factories themselves, but gas stations and the opening up of areas to suburbia, uh, shopping malls, all of these sorts of things. And the fact is, there just aren't any new technologies today, however wondrous they may be in themselves, that have anything like the job-creating potential. Moreover, even if some combination of Keynesian macroeconomics and luck should return the economy to vigorous growth, we'll still be confronted with another, even less tractable, potentially more devastating ecological crisis. That is to say, we're in a tight corner. To combat recession, our economists urge us to spend, 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 while our environmentalists tell us that our overconsumption is killing the planet. It is no accident that governments are deadlocked to the point of dysfunctionality over what to do about the state of the economy and what to do about climate change. Uh, this was a Newsweek cover back in 2009, okay, to respond to the crisis. And this is an economist. I said this some years ago. Only a madman or an economist thinks exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world. So as Brian Berry said, we need a revolution. But what might a restructured economy, a genuinely new economy, look like? Well, not long ago, I received a phone call from my sister-in-law, a fundamentalist Christian, conservative on social issues, but not particularly political otherwise. She made a surprising request. Her pastor had recently taken to railing against socialism. But she knows that I'm a socialist and not a terrible person, so something didn't seem right. Could you explain to me, she asked, what socialism is? Don't refer to me a book, she added. Just write a few pages. 
So I took up the challenge. I didn't attempt an academic treatise. I gave her, in essence, a brief account of my own version of socialism, which includes some institutional specifics, since the question, what is your alternative, has been the central focus of my research and writing for almost 40 years. Here's my multi-part answer to her question. I start with a negative. Uh, now, most people here don't need uh, to be reminded, you, you know these negative, what socialism is not, but I think it's useful when we're not talking to the choir to sort of address this question. So let me just do this real quickly. Socialism is not anti-religious. The fundamental values of socialism are in no way incompatible with the basic moral principles of Christianity or any other major religion. That the most influential of the early socialists, Karl Marx, was an atheist is an historical accident. Marx is a college student fell in with some German atheists, uh, the young Hegelians. But you should remember that Marx broke with the young Hegelians, not over the question of religion, but because he did not think their analysis that it was fundamentally religious superstition that was the cause of Germany's problems. For Marx, it wasn't that. It was the underlying economic structure. Socialism is not opposed to freedom and individuality. Remember the closing lines of the Communist Manifesto. The, uh, urging a society in which the free development of each is a condition for the free development of all. Uh, socialism is not anti-democratic. Again, the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels urge workers to win the battle of democracy. Socialism is, a, is uh, oops, I have one left out here, but anyway, this one's important. Socialism is not opposed to inequalities based on genuine differences of productive contribution. Marx called the leveling down of everyone to a common level crude communism a form inferior to capitalism. Democratic socialists recognize the need for economic incentives to encourage people to develop their talents and to employ them productively. What we don't want are the massive inequalities that keep compounding since under capitalism you can make put your money to work so that the more you have, the more your fortune grows. Socialism is not the wholesale replacement of competition with, comp with uh, a replacement of competition with cooperation. Socialism wants a balanced mix of the two. Certain forms of competition are healthy. We want enterprises to compete, to see who can use their materials most efficiently, who can innovate most productively, who best responds to the, what consumers need and want. Other forms of competition are not healthy. Status competition based on consumption levels, and above all, competition among workers to see who will work for the lowest wage. Okay, the core values of socialism. I think we ought to put those out on the table also. And I think one of the first ones is meaningful work. It's been from the beginning a fundamental tenet of socialism that work is essential to human dignity. Not to be able to find work is devastating to one's self-respect. Society is in essence saying to you, there's nothing you have to offer that we need or want. We may deign to keep you alive, but basically you're a parasite, consuming off the labor of others. I mean, it's no wonder that unemployment creates you know, social pathologies. Intergenerational solidarity. Socialists recognize the social nature of human beings and our profound dependence on one another. No one is truly independent. All of us were once children. Most of us will get sick. Most of us will need to be cared for by those younger than we are, just as we have cared for those younger than us. Since none of us chooses his or her parents or chooses to get sick or chooses to grow old, socialism asks us to assume collective responsibility for each other. Socialism asks that we in some way regard all the children of our society as our children. All the sick is our relatives. All the elderly is our parents. Of course, we have special obligations and feelings uh, for our intimate relations, but we have a larger collective obligations as well which can be met by assuring quality prenatal care, child care, education, health care, and pensions for all members of society and ultimately for everyone in the world. Participatory autonomy. People have the right to participate in the decisions that affect them. This is the core principle of democracy. And yet, under capitalism, it does not extend to the economy. In particular, it does not extend to the workplace, where employers exercise near complete authority nor does it extend to our society's investment priorities, even though such decisions, where to invest or not to invest, in what to invest or not to invest, will affect the long-term structure of our economy and our lives. Socialism aims at overcoming these democratic deficits. And finally, ecological sustainability. 
We need an economy that will work in harmony with our increasingly fragile natural world. We need to regard ourselves as stewards of nature, not masters. Okay, does there exist a form of socialism that would preserve the strengths in, of competitive capitalism while at the same time eliminating or at least mitigating its worst features, among them systematic unemployment and environmental degradation? The answer is yes, if we extend democracy to the economy itself. Consider the structure of the free market capitalism. It consists essentially of three sets of institutions. Competitive markets for goods and services, wage labor, most people have to find someone that owns means of production so you can go to work, and once hired, you, know, you have to do what you're told. And private allocation of investment funds via private financial institutions that raise money from those who have excess and allocate it to businesses promising the highest profitability. Well, let's imagine a form of socialism, which we will call economic democracy, that keeps the first set of institutions, competitive markets for goods and services, but A, replaces most wage labor by cooperative labor, and B, replaces those out of control financial markets with democratic allocation of investment. Let us add C, the government as employer of last resort, and D, public provision of basic education, health care, and pensions. Thus, our new economy would be a competitive market economy with democratic workplaces, transparent public banks answerable to their communities that allocate investment funds in accordance with long-term development needs, full employment, and basic human needs guarantee. <clears throat> Such a socialism would be economically viable and would not suffer the massive evils of capitalism. Okay, let me give you a few more details. In my response to my sister-in-law, I sketched the basic features of economic democracy, but let me be more specific about several of these elements. Let's begin with the basic model. Basically, a free market a capitalist economy has three types of markets. We always talk about a free market economy, but I think it's important to realize there's three different types. The markets for goods and services, labor markets, and capital markets. Economic democracy, uh, retains the first set of markets, but replaces the latter two with more democratic institutions. So the basic model of economic democracy has three components. A market for goods and services, which is essentially the same as under capitalism. Workplace democracy that replaces the capitalist institution of wage labor. Democratic control of investment, which replaces the capitalist financial markets. Now let me elaborate briefly on each of these key institutions. Historical experience makes it clear that markets are a necessary component of a viable socialism. Central planning does not work for a sophisticated economy. The knowledge and incentive problems are too great. How are planners to know in fine-grained detail what consumers want? How do we motivate enterprises to use their resources efficiently and workers to work conscientiously? How do we incentivize innovation? But these markets should be largely confined to goods and services. They should not embrace labor or capital. And of course, they should be regulated so as to protect the health and safety of consumers and producers. Workplace democracy and enterprises in economic democracy are regarded not as entities to be bought or sold, but as communities. When you're employed by a firm, you have a right to vote for members of a worker council. This council appoints upper management and oversees major enterprise decisions. Although managers are granted a degree of autonomy, they are ultimately answerable to the workforce, one person, one vote. All workers share in the profits of the enterprise. Indeed, workers receive not a contractual wage, but a specified share of the company profits. These shares need not be equal, but everyone's income is tied directly to the performance of the firm, hence the incentive to work diligently and efficiently, and to see that your coworkers do the same. Okay, democratic control of investment. Some sort of democratic control is essential if an economy is to develop rationally. But control of investment is exceedingly difficult if the investment funds themselves are privately generated. The solution to this problem is conceptually simple. Don't rely on private investors. When you do, you become a hostage to their confidence and goodwill, as current events amply attest. Generate your investment funds publicly via taxation. A capital assets tax is really the best tax for this purpose for various economic reasons, a flat rate property tax on all businesses. The taxes are collected by the central government. These taxes constitute the national investment fund. All of these revenues are reinvested in the economy. They're not used for other government services. A separate income or consumption tax can fund ongoing government expenses. Uh, 
Each region of the country gets, as a matter of right, its fair share of the National Investment Fund. In most cases, it's per capita share. Regions do not compete for capital. Each and every year, they get their rightful share of the capital assets tax revenue. These funds go to public banks, which channel them back into the economy, utilizing both economic and social criteria, including, importantly, employment creation and environmental sensi sensitivity. Coherent, long-term investment planning at the national, regional, regional, and community level becomes possible. Okay. These are the basic institutions. Markets for goods and services, workplace democracy, social control of investment. Uh, these constitute the defining features of economic democracy, but there are other structures that should be part of our new socialism. Let me comment briefly on two of them. The government is employer of last resort. It's long been a tenet of socialism that everyone who wants to work should have access to a job. Everyone should have a genuine right to work. Long-term voluntary unemployment is not only socially wasteful, but as I've already mentioned, it's psychologically devastating. The solution's simple enough. The government will serve as an employer of last resort. If a person cannot find work elsewhere, the government will provide that person with a job, low wage but decent, doing something useful. An entrepreneurial capitalist sector. In my view, Karl Marx's critique of capitalism remains unsurpassed, but there's an important economic issue that Marx neglected, namely the function of the entrepreneur in society. Marx's analysis of capitalism focuses on the capitalist qua capitalist, i.e. as the provider of capital. This is a passive function, one which can be readily taken over by the state as it is in the case of our basic model, that's the capital assets tax. But there's another role played by some capitalists, the creative entrepreneurial role. This role is assumed by a large number of individuals in a capitalist society, mostly by petty capitalists who set up their own small businesses, but also by some grand capitalists as well, individuals who turn innovative ideas into major industries and reap a fortune in the process. Any society that aspires to be technologically innovative and dynamic must provide incentives for this kind of, in of initiative. It's quite clear from the experience of Soviet socialism that such incentives were sorely lacking in their non-market centrally planned system. So it might be well and good to have some capitalists in our socialist society. Now, although workplace democracy should be the norm throughout society, we needn't demand that all businesses conform to this norm. The petty capitalist, after all, works hard. He's anything but a parasite. It takes energy, initiative, and intelligence to run a small business. These small businesses provide jobs for large numbers of people and goods and services for many more. Now, petty capitalists may provide important services to society, but they do not provide much in the way of technological or organizational innovation. There's also an honorable role to play in a socialist society for entrepreneurial capitalists who operate on a grander scale. Such an entrepreneurial capitalist class need not pose a serious threat to a society in which democratic workplaces are predominant. Democratic firms, when they have equal access to investment capital, need not fear competition from capitalist firms. On the contrary, since capitalist firms must compete with democratic firms for workers, they will be under considerable pressure to at least partially democratize their own operations by instituting profit sharing and more participatory work relations. Moreover, there's a rather simple legal mechanism that can be put in place to keep this capitalist class in check. The basic problem with capitalists under capitalism is not their active entrepreneurial role, which relatively few capitalists actually play, but their passive role as suppliers of capital. Economic democracy offers a transparent, rational substitute for this latter role, a capital assets tax. So the trick is to develop a mechanism that would prevent the active entrepreneurial capitalist from becoming the passive parasitic one. Such a mechanism is easy enough to envisage, a simple two-part law stipulating that A, an enterprise developed by an entrepreneurial capitalist can be sold at any time, but if it exceeds a certain size, only to the state, for a sum equal to the value of the assets upon which the capitalist assets tax is paid. And B, the enterprise must be sold when the owner retires or dies. When the state purchases an enterprise, it turns it over to the enterprise workers to be run democratically. Thus, the entrepreneurial capitalists serve two socially useful functions. They're the source of innovation and an incubator of new democratic enterprises. Entrepreneurial capitalists have a significant role to play in our economic, in our democratic socialist society. 
Okay, economic democracy and, econo and eco economic ecological crises. Now, I've argued at length elsewhere that economic democracy is preferable to capitalism across a wide array of non-economic and economic values. Economic democracy would not only be efficient and innovative, it would be much more democratic than capitalism, vastly more egalitarian, more rational in its development. It's also the case that economic democracy would not be vulnerable to the kinds of economic crises uh, that uh, we are now experiencing. The basic reason is simple. There are no private financial markets uh, in economic democracy. Markets for goods and services remain, but there are no stock markets, bond markets, hedge funds, or private investment banks concocting collateralized debt obligations, currency swaps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's no opportunity for financial speculation. Our financial system is quite transparent. A capital assets tax is collected from businesses, then loaned out to enterprises wanting to expand or to individuals wanting to start new businesses. Loan officers are public officials whose salaries are tied to loan performances. The loans they make are a matter of public record, as are the performances of those loans. There's nothing mysterious about finance in an economic democracy. Now, immunity to speculation is not the only strength of economic democracy. Even more important, it's not vulnerable to the deep problem we've considered, insufficient effective demand, due ultimately to the fact that uh, wages tend not to keep pace with increases in productivity. For wages are a cost of production in a capitalist firm, and so capitalists strive to keep wages down. But wages are not a cost of production in a democratic firm. Workers receive a specified share of the firm's profit, not a wage. So all productivity gains are captured by the firm's workforce. Workers' income always keeps pace with productivity gains. Now, capitalism we've seen faces the even deeper problem, the one responsible for the economic crisis, than the one responsible uh, now holding us in its grip. Should we succeed in getting our economies growing again, and indeed, even if we don't, we'll soon find ourselves in an ecological crisis or more precisely, ecological crises, the large global ones, many smaller regional ones. Economic democracy is far better positioned than capitalism to avoid ecological crises. First of all, democratic control over investment means control over development. We can aim for a healthy, equitable, sustainable development, not the mindless consumption that fails to make people happy anyway. Moreover, since the funds for investment in an economic democracy do not come from private investors, the economy is not hostage to investor confidence. We need not worry that an economic slowdown will panic investors, provoking them to pull their money out of the financial markets, triggering a recession. There aren't any private investors. Economic democracy can be a healthy, sustainable, no-growth economy, whereas capitalism cannot be. Actually, no growth is a misnomer. Productivity increases under economic democracy can be translated to increased leisure instead of ever-increasing consumption. When introducing a more productive technology into an enterprise, workers in a democratic firm have a choice not available to their counterparts in a capitalist firm. They can choose to take their productivity gains in the form of shorter work weeks or longer vacations rather than higher incomes. Given the importance of scaling back excessive consumption, the government can encourage these leisure over consumption choices. It can do so without having to worry about provoking a recession. The economy will continue to experience growth, but the growth will be mostly in free time, not consumption. Conclusion. It's interesting to note that the greatest economist of the 20th century anticipated such a leisure-based economy. In a remarkable essay written just after the onset of the Great Depression, John Maynard Keynes speculated about the economic possibilities for our grandchildren. He offered a prediction of, as to what our world would look like a hundred years hence. We shall use the newfound bounty of nature quite differently than the way the rich use it today, and we'll map out for ourselves a plan of life quite otherwise than theirs. What work there still remains to be done will be as widely shared as possible, three-hour shifts or a 15-hour week. There will also be great changes in our morals. I see us free to return to some of the most sure and certain principles of religion and traditional virtue, that avarice is a vice, that the extraction of usury is a misdemeanor, and the love of money is detestable, that those walk most truly in the paths of virtue and sane wisdom who take the least thought for the morrow, we shall honor those who can teach us how to pluck the hour and the day virtuously and well, 
the delightful people who are capable of taking direct enjoyment in things. Keynes wrote these words in, in 1930 at a time when, quote, the prevailing world depression, the enormous anomaly of unemployment, the disastrous mistakes we have made blind us to what is going on under the surface. Keynes's projection was for 100 years hence, i.e. 2030, no longer the distant future. We should ask ourselves, might there be things going on under the surface right now that could bring us to a sustainable, democratic, human world? We should ask ourselves, what can we do now to hasten the arrival of such a world? One final note. I opened with a quote from a recently deceased progressive thinker, Brian Barry. Let me close with another. The great novelist Kurt and essayist Kurt Vonnegut concluded his final book, A Man Without a Country, published shortly before his death in 2007 with a poem. It's not a happy poem. It's entitled Requiem. The crucified planet Earth, should it find a voice and a sense of irony, might now well say of our abuse of it, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. The irony would be that we know what we are doing. When the last living thing has died on account of us, how poetical it would be if the earth would say, in a voice floating up perhaps from the floor of the Grand Canyon, it is done. People did not like it here. That's what's at stake. Sort of mirroring this just a couple weeks ago, the New Yorker, there's the ship going down, and there's the plutocrat that are also going to go down. So we have to remember this. You all know this. Philosophers have interpreted the world in various ways, not just philosophers. The point, however, is to change it. Thank you. Tough act to follow and wonderful work. Um, if you look at David's new, David's new book, which is a revision and really big change in, in the writing of the last of the earlier version, you'll find the top endorsement is from me as I think by far the most sophisticated work done on, on modern socialist thought that anyone has done. So I'm uh, pleased and honored to be with David here. Uh, and I have some challenges. <laughs> so, um, so what he has offered, I think, is a powerful uh, scaffolding for us to grapple with. And in private correspondence, that's, I think, what he intends it to be, for us to chew on it and maybe transcend it or look at it in a different way. So one of the starting places, I want to give you two starting places. Uh, this, the book is kind of generic in its approach. It is not specific to the United States, but I want to talk about something specific to the United States, and I think that's important. So that the question of how you evolve and how you change becomes uh, not entirely society specific, but certainly there are differences between what we're thinking about, what the Cubans are thinking about, the Algerians, the Chinese, and what this country might think about. Uh, the continental system, much greater, you know, you can drop Germany into Montana. Some of the political problems of the scale of the country become very critical, and I think we need to face some of those. But the heart of the model that we've been talking, that David talks about, and I'm using it as scaffolding, as we've discussed, is worker ownership of the means of production in a way that is, there's a social ownership component, but it is worker control of the means of production by the workforce in particular firms, okay? So now that's the, and then there's a market, and it's a controlled market and various mechanisms to try to control the market. And the question is, is that the appropriate model, the central model for the new society or not? And there are some problems with it, and I'll give you some of the problems. Uh, and having said that, I'm a proponent of worker ownership. And I don't think it's the answer. I think it's a transitional form, and I think we need to look beyond it. So for it, let me give you a couple ways to think about it. Uh, these are uh, symbolic ways to think about it. Do the oil workers and the garbage workers have the same interest and the same control? Does the spe specificity of the firm give different interests to different groups and different power to different groups. Let that one sink in for a while. In a community, do the workers who control the means of force, policemen, get to control their industry? Or are they subordinate to the community as a collectivity? 
So the notion of the community as a collectivity becomes a primary question in democratic theory. A great deal of socialist thought, and I think it's a really important point to understand, has neglected democratic theory. Some of it has talked about political theory, and some of it has talked about institutional theory. So I'm coming at this from those three different angles. And I'll give you another way to come at this in a, in, from a different perspective so we can open it up. I'm going to do it this way, piece by piece, and then come to a larger fan. We've been doing a great deal of work in the city of Cleveland, uh, the Democracy Collaborative, an organization that I co-founded with Ted Howard. And in that community, we are helping generate a large number of worker-owned co-ops. There is a large industrial-scale laundry set up. There is a new solar installation firm. We just broke ground on a large uh, greenhouse, partly solar, partly windmill, which will produce about 5 million heads of lettuce a year. These are large-scale co-ops, not little co-ops, and two or three businesses being developed a year. So we are developing these on the ground. And following the model I'm about to describe, several other communities are in the process of doing the same thing. There are communities in Oakland, California, Pittsburgh, Atlanta, someone in Texas, Maryland, are following something like the following model. And I'm giving it to you, not so much because I want you to know about the model, but the elements of it present a different logic. The worker-owned co-ops in this model are subordinate to a nonprofit community-wide corporation that has controlling interests. They cannot be sold. They cannot take excess profits. There's a revolving fund. And the goal is the reconstruction of the community. And the worker companies are self-managed. So that the balance of power and the balance of the theory is to create a community institution and a community culture, and that also includes worker self-management as a subordinate but not dominant theme. It is a different structure from the one that's just been outlined, which puts the worker-owned companies on the market and independent, and hopes, I think it's fair to say, hopes that a separate community institution, a banking institution, would there, then lead into that process and be able to Turn off, this, turn off my cell phone. Um, sorry about that. Oh, modern technology. Sorry about that. So the, the notion is that, there, that you can allow the development of significant autonomous centers of economic power and corral them, I'm using an unfair term, by a collectivity representing the whole. That is a city or a county, or a region in your model and in the models we've been looking at, or a nation state. And we think that's a fundamental question that has to be faced both in economic theory and in political theory. And our judgment, as you know, some of the developments, and there have been very few interesting actual worker-owned companies in the United States, the famous plywood ones that were studied, did not produce a culture that you would consider socialist. They produced a very conservative individualist culture because the, the people wanted to again, as much as they could, and they hired uh, wage labor to, at lower prices. So the structures have interior materialist proponents and, and capacities. So the first question that to ask is, is that institution the central institution that should be built into the new system? And, or is it a subordinate and important institution, but needs to be subordinated from the get-go? And the argument is that you will never get it back if you start building it without starting with a much larger conception of the commune iti, the commune, the larger sentence. So that's a central argument that I'd like to throw on the table for further discussion. And we think that's an important element in the decision-making process. And it is underway right now in this country. There are many worker-owned companies in the United States, almost entirely ESOPs. Employee stock ownership plans, about five to six million more people involved in these companies than are members of unions in the private sector. Extraordinary. They're not covered. What, 11,000 of them, 13 million people involved. Almost no democratic control, though they could be. Some of them are, and some are unionized. But the whole direction of worker ownership in this country is largely an ESOP direction. Lots of valuable experience, by the way. I, I think that the next round in the younger generation that's going to take over the ESOP movement may very well produce some very interesting things. There are maybe 500 or 300 genuine worker 
egalitarian co-ops. The number is it's hard to get a, a picture of it. But they're very small and very difficult to develop. So the second proposition I want to toss out in terms of the discussion is the path that one takes in developing the new system is not an abstract path. And that's why I want to focus on the United States. The models that are given in David's are essentially political models. And in correspondence, one hopes that when there is a political consciousness, it will bring with it a socialist consciousness that will then permeate the culture. I take a different view that that's a possibility. But in a decaying, stagnating, and stalemated system, we agree on what's happening. Note carefully, a system that neither collapses, probably, the government is 30% to 33% of the GDP. It was 11% in 1929. There's a large floor under the system, weird stuff, but doesn't reform. Highly unusual situation and highly unusual historic context, particularly in this system. One in which probably the path that might develop is an evolutionary reconstructive path, slow development of many institutions. And I could give you a listings of things we study. We study these evolving institutions around the country. I mean, there, there are 120 million people involved in co-ops in one form, mostly credit unions and consumer co-ops, 120 million. There are 44 to 5,000 neighborhood corporations. There are thousands of social enterprises in which produce some sort of profit for communities. There are all, all these ESOPs. So there's a whole s development. There are many states that are developing social ownership or proposals for banks on the North Dakota model. There are 14 states now considering that. There are 20 states considering single payer health care. So there is an evolving pluralist forms, not plural forms of changing the form of ownership. The evolving path forward is critical in this context if it is a possibility that this country might move to lay the foundations institutionally and critically culturally to the next transformation. And our judgment is that worker-owned firms play a role in that, and particularly for one reason, but not the dominant role. This is a country with no socialist tradition, or a very small socialist tradition. The name of the game is who owns the capital. That was always the name of the game. And with the 1% owning literally half of the investment capital, and 5% owning 70% of the investment capital, either the ownership becomes democratized, or the power structure continues. So the form of that democratization and its evolutionary dynamic becomes the central question in an evolving pat path. So if you bet on worker-owned companies as the evolving mechanism, I think you end up with some of the problems that we've seen in many other countries and in our own worker-owned companies. If you bet on building a new structure that attempts to make it a pluralist structure and community-based, you have a chance maybe, of beginning to alter the culture and the forms in which this con the, the context of worker and economic ownership is considered and developed in time. So look, I've come at this, I'm an economist and a, and a historian. I've come at the economic mechanisms, and I'll come to them late, I'm coming at them from a historical evolutionary perspective. Is there a path? From a contextual perspective, does this particular framing of the historic era we're in open a path, and from a cultural and institutional p perspective, how does the institution unfold towards the goal we are looking for? I'm David David's a math, he has a PhD in mathematics and philosophy, so I hesitate to say we've got to solve a quadratic equation here. That is to say, it's got to meet all three criteria, and it becomes community and, and country specific. In this country, probably the worker ownership model is not the model that will develop. There is more likelihood, and, and importantly better, I think, that we work from the American concept of community and the decaying problems of American communities that are beginning to open up ways of developing. We are finding in community after community after community, local people who considered from one perspective are, quote, conservative, viewed from the perspective of the community if there is a practical answer, begin to revolve around these kinds of questions and are supportive, not negative. The problem often is with people on the left who don't talk to them and haven't offered a practical way forward. 
So to back up, I'm suggesting that one of the problems that we need to face in any model that we talk about, the central question is who owns the capital? And if you put it in worker-owned companies, pure worker-owned companies, something like the Yugoslav model, which is in some part of it, I think you have a problem. Now let me come at it another way. Mondragon is very hot these days. Everyone's talking about Mondragon, as, and your book brings it up, and I, I am myself very interested, in, and I'm, I think many lessons from the Mondragon Corporation and the Basque. You all know about the Basque experience, so I don't need to go through with it. And very brilliant and interesting developmental possibilities and, and cooperation among workers and participation in that model. Much to learn from it. And it is operating in a global capitalist sea. It is up against the global market, and it is in trouble. And it is, you will hear much more about Mondragon in this country. And the reason you'll hear about it is they're over here looking for markets. And it's a very sexy model, and not adequately understood or examined by the left because it's so sexy, and they say worker ownership and worker participation because it's very exciting. But the model is not a system transformation model. That's not what it's about. It's about getting jobs for people in the Basque region and getting markets for them. That's the name of the game. It does not look to produce socialism. It does not look to transform the power of the state. It does not look to national economic planning. It doesn't look for capital allocation. It is a brilliantly designed, based on Catholic social thought, and there's a long history of it, some of which is well developed in David's book, but, but it is in the market and is up against the Chinese and the East Europeans now in the market, and it's getting in trouble. So, Mondragon, yes, in terms of its internal practices, but what about the market? So that's the second major institutional feature we have to come up against. The market has these qualities and, I, and, and drives, and I think this is where David and I may disagree in, uh, on a specific point of economics, that David rests his model on uh, the belief that, we are, that these companies will reach uh, limited, there is no increasing returns to scale. That's, because if there are increasing returns to scale for um, mostly economists in this room, those companies are going to expand and have to expand. And if there's limited, if there are returns to scale are constant, there may or may not be reasons to expand. But if there are increasing returns to scale, you're in trouble because the model is expansionary. Or for defensive reasons, they have to expand because somebody else might expand and take the market. These are, these are, we're operating in a, in a market economy owned by companies. So the question becomes the relationship, first the, the question of whether or not there are economies of scale, not simply technological. Above all, marketing and research. Marketing and research become very important in firm development. So the 33% of American companies now are over 10,000 employees. Something like 55% are over 500. It depends where you draw the line. 20, there's a, Anybody who's played with these numbers, there's a problem because anybody who's done any consulting or given one lecture for, for $100 shows up as an individual entrepreneur in the statistics. You've got to be very careful with them. But there are large, in the United States, you're looking minimally at a third of the companies, a third of the population works in companies of 10,000. So the question about worker control or ownership within that structure is a really important question. And whether or not there are economies of scale of all kinds is this another very important question, because if there are, the market drives these companies to expand. And now we're up against not only the market, we're up against the ecological problem. So a system that, looking forward into the 21st century, has got to deal with growth. And not, not just you're trying to constrain it, but whether the institutional dynamics actually can allow you to restrain and control growth. And if the firms have to grow, or if they have a strong desire to grow or an internal reason to grow, and critical, another point, sufficient political power to alter the regulations that might be put on them. Let me say that again. A good part of this model depends upon whether you can regulate it. And that's an institutional power question. The companies may or may not find, as we know from the banking system, companies may or may not find ways, if it's in their interest, to change the way regulations are set up around any form, particularly worker-owned companies or not. So if the dynamic is growth-driven, you have a very powerful problem if you're interested in the climate change or ecological sustainability. And I think there are reasons to question any market-driven system, and including a worker-owner system, not only a worker-owner system. So let me tell you how 
uh, another way to think about it in terms of the models we've been experimenting with in Cleveland and elsewhere. The co-ops I mentioned to you, they're, they're very carefully designed, and they're designed with these kinds of properties. We're, we're not sure, this is not the final answer, but these, this is the kind of thinking that's going into these models. Not only is the structure community, on the ground, nonprofit, with worker-owned companies as part of it, and a revolving fund in the middle, so you can expand it, it is aimed primarily at a public market. That's a planning system. So in this case, the public market in Cleveland is the nonprofit corporations that are heavily subsidized by the public, healthcare, hospitals, and universities, who in a small 40,000 neighborhood of Cleveland, where the average income is $18,000 a year, purchase $3 billion a year in goods and services, plus salary, plus investment. Part of that procurement, think of the industrial scale laundry in a hospital, part of, and the food, Part of that procurement is now being directed as a sheltered public market for some of these co-ops. And it has this property. It means that you are not forced into the private market. You have substantial stability from a market, and we use the market as a check against the public marketing system. So the design is a tricky design. It's not tricky at all. It's, it's a, it's a very specific proponent that is a planned system in miniature and using the market to keep it honest rather than a market-driven system that is not a full planning system with a public market. So that's the design with the goal of trying to stabilize and undercut these pressures that lead to expansionary forces in any market system. So if you want to think about it in large scale, the model would be the US government decides to do mass transit and rail, high-speed rail. That's all public money or commuter money. Who's going to build that stuff? The company could be worker, community owned, owned, and the procurement, the public market, becomes the planning system that gives stability to that complex. That's the same, that's just the larger version of what I just said about Cleveland. So the design system is, yes, much more planning of the market but using other firms and other parts of it to check the problems that we know come with planning. But the real question to ask yourself in all of these models, the one I just sketched or the one that David has developed at great length, is do we actually have sufficient power in the model? When power, when I mean institutional model power, inherent cultural power, to undercut the pressures that will lead to expansion and growth. If not, the model is an ecological disaster. So it's a very critical moment to, to look at that in a very intense way. We might even give some inefficiencies to solve that problem. I mean, stand back for the United States, the, the latest numbers on GDP per capita, lousy measure to be sure, we're just a, we're approaching $200,000 for every family of four. I think it's 189 or 190 last time I looked at it. So tomorrow, in terms of the numbers, you could have $100,000 for every family of four and cut the work week to 20. Development is not our problem. Distribution, the politics of it, and culture are our problems. So I'm prepared to give inefficiencies of some kind on the planning and market system if we can get at the ecological problem because that's the one that's really coming up against us. Now it may be different, that's why I said the model may be different in other countries and has to be looked at in different ways in, in countries that are not like ours. But if you're looking at this country, you might give some inefficiencies in, to have a much better control of the planning system. So let me move to another level of this and then two or three more comments to, to lay it out and I'm sure we're gonna have some dialogue on it. Um, what I like about the model that Dave, David and I share a view that the, uh, in the United States in particular, but I think in all the, all the countries from our, as I read your book, but in the United States in particular, regional structures become important in allocating capital. Now that's a very odd sentence I just said. And then one way to think about it, and I think David writes it this way, if democratically elected regional councils would help allocate capital within the regions, who controls the, region, the regional decision-making problem? I used to work in the Congress, both houses, House and Senate, and I worked in the executive branch. Who controls the theoretical decision-making is about institutional power every time the corporations are in there and they're moving powerfully and moving and controlling decision-making and shaping it. Who controls those decision-making questions in the regional planning and allocation of power? Ultimately, I don't think 
this is a really nasty part of the problem, not for David or me, for all of us. If you're talking about regional allocation of capital in a continent of 310 million moving towards 500 million, and if you take the high, high projection of the Census Bureau, one billion by the end of the century, whatever that number is, you tell me how you have participatory democracy in a continent moving towards a billion. Not possible. Ultimately, the answer does move towards regional scale, but probably not simply regional election of people to allocate capital, because the issues involved in the allocation of capital are social, political, and ecological well beyond who controls the capital. They, they are essentially legislatures. They're almost saying the country ought to be broken up into many other countries. Something like that is implicit in allowing allocation of capital at the regional level. Now, that's a very nasty proposition. I think it's one we share that, that that's, where, that's where these models go. It's either that or Washington in a, in a continental, continental scale system. So I, I think I, I don't, I say that not fancifully. I think those questions are on the table as we move down the population trajectory and as we deal with the ecological problem and as, Wal and as Washington is stalemated for its own reasons so that the problems can't be solved there. The question of what happens around the country becomes a regional question. But what it tosses you into is the European problems that are being faced right now. How do you manage a continental system? Where's the financing? Do you, do you break it up into different banks? All the questions that are going on in Europe are posed by the notion of a regional structure that we both share. That's very, you know, what, it, what I really like about David's book is it opens these questions sharply and clearly that we haven't wanted to struggle with. I mean, we've been very abstract about it, and the mechanisms and the really tough issues have to be put on the table, including this one, how you allocate capital. Even as his, in his system, the national system allocates per capita, roughly speaking, to all the regions, but then there's a regional body that really makes the allocations, democratically elected. That turns out to be a government if you actually look at it. So really, you're talking about breaking the country up into regional governments. And I think that's, that question is on the table for this century, I think, as the scale and the population grow. So let me back up, on, onto the, uh, back, back up and look at it still another way, different lens. The issues that we're talking about essentially, I think for the first time in modern history, we can pose them in terms of the fundamental values of democratic theory, democracy, liberty, and equality, and ecological sustainability. Now let me sharpen that. The reason I say it's the first time, because only we have not had a mechanism that can allow the sustaining of the preconditions of democracy in this country ever. The preconditions of democracy is citizens who actually know how to be a citizen rather than a voter, really know how to participate, not just in the workplace which is a very important part of it. But remember, two-thirds of the society at any moment in time is not in the workforce. It's young, old, women at home or men at home, children in school. About a third is in the workforce. How do you learn to be a citizen? And I'm, I'm not raising it rhetorically. I'm raising it in terms of John Stuart Mill's way of doing it, Tocqueville's way of doing it, Ben Barber, the, the, the philosopher that you talked about as well. The question becomes, is there a place in the system design and that's what we're talking about. These are system designs. Is there a place where actually citizens can make sufficiently powerful decisions so it matters, so they become citizens? And if the structure of democracy requires that that be a community, not just a workplace, that everybody, the old, the young, the, the people not working, have a stake, then the rebuilding of stability in communities becomes one precondition and the second becomes structures that are inclusive enough so that democratic processes are actually real rather than secondary to the institutional power relationships of companies, private or worker, that are, are secondary. We're on the verge of looking at that in many American communities as a reality, and I think that question, how to build the preconditions of citizens, not just voters, becomes the way one lens to look at this. And I, I suggest to you that requires us to go beyond worker ownership to community structures. I am skeptical from my study of, the, of these issues and from my study of worker ownership that the worker ownership form alone 
will allow you to break, that, break the bind of that because they have their own interests as firms. No matter how you try to rig the regulations, they tend to find a way around them because they're operating in a market. So worker ownership, yes. Worker ownership is part of the larger structure. And worker ownership as a way to break down the American mythology about ownership in general as a transitional idea. I'm, I'm a pro, having, you've heard me critique worker ownership. I'm a proponent of worker ownership in this culture as one of the elements allowing us to begin to rethink the whole structure because it's real and people can get their hands on it and it opens many questions. It doesn't close all the questions. So a final point about all this, I think, really, uh, and here I think we do share a view these questions really are on the table for Americans in a way that they have never been before. And I think our profession has got to step up to that question. We like to stay in the background of many subfields. If people in this particular world that is assembled at this particular conference don't step up to these questions, nobody will. The questions that are on the scale, if capitalism doesn't work and traditional socialism doesn't work and we're in a long-term bind, what the hell do you want? And is it a sophisticated answer? And is it meaningful and real? So I take my hat off to David and the other people who have been working in this field to say, look, now is the time to ask very tough questions about what do we really think and what do we really want and how do we begin to lay out growth paths, growth of institutions and people and politics that begin to move us in that direction, even in the midst of a very, very dreary time. Let me shift that around. Oddly, paradoxically, what we are seeing in the work we do, and I'll give you a website, community-wealth, where we survey lots and lots and lots and lots of developments that are on the ground, we're finding that paradoxically, in the midst of the stalemate, decay, social and economic pain, and largely because of it, and because the traditional liberal or social democratic policies have no power, so the pain continues, institution change, institutional building is being forced on the ground. And people all over the country, the press doesn't cover it, they don't have the money to cover it or the interest, or all over the country will find people developing, changing the ownership of capital as ordinary and practical in American experience, whether it be the co-ops or the forms of the, the CDC forms, the more advanced CDC forms, the worker companies we see, the state efforts. And I think that trend is very likely at the level of the farthest points of the internal empire, where the decay and pain are greatest in the localities and the states, I think you're beginning to see a very down-home, extremely American, non-rhetorical, non-ideological development of changing the ownership of the means of production for real in American cities and communities. And it is very important because it is cracking through what Gramsci called the hege 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 hegemonic ideologies in a, not a negative way, but a positive way, particularly in a country that has no socialist background. So, if I think there's one thing we really share, this is a really important time to get very serious. And I would say the best place to start, though I wouldn't finish there, is with David's wonder, wonderful book. Thank you very much. Could I make just one quick comment? Please. You know, first of all, I want to just it's an honor for me to be on a panel with Carl Perovitz, and he's done so much great work over the years. And America after capitalism, do you want to just see some on the ground experiments of what are going on here? You know, that's definitely, you know, a place to look as well as, you know, many other things. Uh, one theoretical point, though, that we, we were talking about here, because it was alluded to, but I think it's important to get this out and then we can, the discussions. Uh, the question of whether democratic workplaces tend to be expansionary or not. I mean, it's been part of the theoretical literature that says generally not, okay? And in fact, that's one of the crucial answers, I think, to this question that is often, always comes up when you talk about workplace democracy. If these are as efficient as you say they are, and if the studies seem to show that democratic workforces are more efficient, or at least as efficient as cap, why aren't there lots more of them? You know, part of the answer is they don't have the same expansionary dynamic. 
simple example. Okay, you set up your own little workplace. You, you, first, you're a capitalist. You set up your nice little hamburger stand. You know, your name might be Croc, for example. It makes money. What do you do? Well, let's set up another one. Let's set up another one because if I make 10,000 from this, 20,000, 30,000, there's an inherent tendency, if it works, under constant returns to scale, you're gonna keep expanding, okay? Democratic firm, you and your friends set up exactly the same kind of stand, exactly the same kind of burger, it works just as well. Will you set up another one? Well, no, because you gotta bring in twice as many people and you have twice as much profit, but you got twice as many people to you know, divide it up among. So you want to compete, you don't want to lose market share, but you don't have that same expansionary dynamic. The example I like to use, you know, more immediate is look at universities. You know, I teach at Loyola University, there's DePaul up the street. We watch what they're doing, we don't want to lose market share, but we don't want to drive DePaul out of business. We don't want to double our expand. Why would we want to do that? It's a non we're a nonprofit, okay, so there's no point to that. So I think the fact that it doesn't have the same expansionary dynamic is really important and it's only under conditions of, con of, ex of increasing returns to scale that you get that. Totally agree. Uh, yeah. it, but the one other thing is also, and I'm trying to bring in this idea of you know, the, the, the bank financing here. You know. Even if a firm wants to expand, it's got to go to the public bank. It doesn't have its own resources. So we do have some kind of democratic control over you know, the size that these firms are, you know, are going to be uh, allowed to do. And then just one other thing, sort of backing up a little bit. I mean, in a sense, we're dealing with like, the same issues from different directions. I mean, I came to this research project having red marks, having been blown away, you know, the critique of capitalism. But at a time when any time I said that, I always heard, well, what's your alternative, you know? So the idea is, I think you need a simple, you need something that people can, you know, wrap their minds around, a simple alternative. You can show that, you know, this would work, you know, you can talk to economists about that. You can make, you know, you've got a model. Granted, in practice, it's gonna be different than that, you know? And, uh, and, and but I think it's also important if you have a, a larger vision of what the pieces are that you got to deal with, then you can look at things on the ground and see how they relate. So you can see how the you know, worker-run enterprises, worker, now notice in my model, workers don't own the enterprise. You know, they rent it from the state, effectively. They lease it from the state, and so on. But, uh, but you can see how worker self-management relates to the National Bank of North Dakota, for example. There's this, we gotta get con democratic control over capital, that's one thing, and we need democratic control over labor, you know, and, uh, and the community, community mediates there, you know, very important. S State Bank of uh, the North Dakota, right. right. yeah, yeah. But, uh, so, yeah, so it's nicely focused, because I totally agree with what David said about and under, under constant returns. That is it, but the question is, are there increasing returns to scale? And I think not just technological. Uh, that, uh, the questions on marketing and finance, and finance becomes not simply what the bank will let you do, as we have learned, but whether or not the institutions have sufficient interest and power to get the bank to change its regs. So you, it, I've been badly burned by this, working in politics and <laughs> running state, doing legislation several times. Nice pattern. But in fact, the institutional power relationships, they just find a way around it. That's what happened in the American banking system. So the design problem is institutional as well as economic. Do they have power to run the game around you? And cultural. Do you begin to really actually face the question of are these institutions actually generating a culture of we are in it together as a community? Or are they generating a culture of let's get ours under the market? That become, those two things, the institutional power and the cultural problem become central in all these socialist designs because that's where they break down. That the institutional power is such that the state takes over or they become aggressively individualist or they become expansionary and they institutionally don't deal with this question. I think that's, the conservatives were right about that. There was something wrong with state socialism. That they were right in that sense. So we need to address culture and institutional power as well as the economics, and the pieces have to begin to get very seriously fitting together. So under expansionary returns is the problem. Not, I agree with what he said about uh, stable returns. Uh, you want me to just jump in? Sure. Okay, let's see. Uh, the investment mechanism, is there equity investment? No, I'm not, the basic model is no, there's no equity investment. You know, 
all finance comes actually from the, from the public banks, okay? Uh, and the question, well, are there rules saying you can't invest your own profits? The basic model that I lay out there says, yeah, there are rules. You know, all of, the, all of the profits get returned to the workers as income, okay? If you want to expand, if you want, then you've got to go to this public authority. You've got to go to the banks. You've got to apply for a loan, you know, from the public banking system. The point there is, first of all, now, in practice, you may want to loosen that. You've got to try it out, see whether it's a problem or not. But the, the, the underlying idea here is, you know, you want community control over expansion and, and things like that. So, and how are those legislators going to, yeah, that's dem democratically, you know, it probably would be the legislators, you know, in the community. My model is you got it at several levels. You've got a national legislator which sets certain priorities, you know, then you can have the regions can set certain priorities. Priorities meaning in all cases when it gets to the making loans to the cooperative or private businesses there, they have to be profitable. So you, these are public funds. You don't want your, your, loan, your banks making loans to companies that are going to go bankrupt and so on and so forth. So that is part of the criteria that the loan officer who's a public official will be evaluated by, but the community can set additional criteria. We'll give lower interest loans for ecologically, you know, retooling in an ecologically more better way lower interest loans if you will create more employment, you know, this kind of stuff. So we want this public community control, you know, over the, the investment because the investment determines the direction and quality of your, of your uh, economy over time. Uh, so the marketing, yeah, I mean, and I, my answer would be the same as what you raised there. If, you know, the, no, you can regulate marketing a lot more you know, in a democratic economy where you don't have to worry about the firms. If they're not expanding, if you're not growing, you know, then you're going to have an economic crisis. Well, you, you don't need to keep expanding a democratic firm. So yes, you can put regulations on marketing. Uh, you want the competition to promote technical efficiency, but not branding and all this kind of stuff. That has nothing to do, you know, with technical efficiency. So you can, it seems to be, you can certainly regulate that. And as far as uh, the worker ownership, I mean, that's why in the, my basic model, you know, you, you know, it's the Marxian sensibility. The means of production were created by other workers there, okay? They are the collective patrimony of the state. What a group of workers can do is lease that, you know, from the state. That's what, in my model, that's what the capital assets tax is. It's a leasing fee, you know, that you are leasing it. Now, once you've got it, you can control it. You can do with what you want. You can't sell it. You can't let it run down. You've got to keep a depreciation fund and things like that. But it, you know, it is meant to change that idea of, you know, ownership, meaning, you know, I can do whatever I want with this stuff. Um, briefly, I think we've, we've kind of kicked this horse back and forth a lot. Uh, the, 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 I mean, it's nice because it tells you where the, where the difference is on, on the question. Uh, I am very skeptical of regulatory processes of this kind because I, I believe the institutional power whatever you say, will has strong interest in getting control of those regulators and that they will deal with it in a very powerful way. So I'm skeptical that this will work because uh, both of my historical studies and my sense of how things work and my judgment on it, it's a judgment call. Um, and therefore, I'm very interested in are we talking about creating a different culture and a different structure from the get-go that begins to, be off to internalize all that. Um, and I would add, which is the, int the most interesting piece of this to me, you know, I've been, he and I have been doing this for a long time, <laughs> and we're friends about this. I think what's happening is that you're seeing the community structure grow faster than the worker ownership structure. It's very interesting, unexpected. We were totally blown away how, how this particular model that we've been trying to develop in one way or another has been, it's, it's getting some less, getting some, some traction where worker ownership is not. Worker-owned co-ops are really hard to do. So uh, we'll, I, we'll see where that goes. It may go nowhere, but at the moment, that's a surprise. So it, is, it goes back to whether or not the, you can control the regulators and how the institution culture, we don't need to beat that horse anymore. And returns of scale. I mean, the returns of scale question is implicit in all of that. I didn't think nothing changes. I think what's, let me, let me be clearer about that. I think what, in the traditional, the, the two models that most of 
modern culture has talked about in terms of these questions are the pendulum will swing and will advance along a liberal line of increased pro progress, meaning that we will be able to regulate the corporate. Capital doesn't change. The corporations control the capital, and we regulate them better, and we tax them better, and we spend better. That's a liberal model. I come out of that liberal tradition. That's, that's, I'm a Wisconsin progressive. That's where I'm from. That model, I think, is at a dead end. And I think it's at a dead end in this country because the labor movement's gone from 34, 35 percent to 11 percent and going down. And the, the basis of a social democratic model of that kind is disintegrating before your eyes. On the other hand, the other model that we know anything about is collapse, crisis revolution. By the way, Marx didn't think, the, thought the United States might go through something like what we're talking about, which is I call evolutionary reconstruction. Marx thought that Britain, the United States, and maybe the Netherlands might have a nonviolent transition to socialism in some of his obiter decta, not always. What I think is, so I don't think that either of those things are on. I do think that the context of stalemate, stagnation, and decay, which is what our historic era is, I think, and I would really, it's important to call it that. We, we totally agree on this, that this is a historic context that's different. Doesn't it, it might go to fascism if there's violence, but it also has this odd property of creating ideological disillusionment. People know something's wrong in a way that never has been, in my experience, and forcing people to rethink and developing on the ground stuff that is really interesting because there's no alternative. That's a very, very important moment in history and very unusual. This is not the Great Depression. And it's not World War II bailing it out in the post-war boom, offering technological, some of, some of the things David was talking about. So I think this is the most exciting period of my life. I think it's the most exciting period of American history because, let me put it, let me give a broad sweep on this historian sweep. They ran the thing in the 19th century by giving away land and taking it from the Indians. And they ran it in the 20th century not by designing wars, but by having a war in the first quarter of the century, in the second quarter of the century, in the Korean War, in the Vietnam War, in the Cold War, stabilizing the economy. We run out of land, we're running out of wars. And I mean that. You can't have nuclear wars. The military defense as a percentage of GDP is going down, not up. It's large, but it's not relatively large. So it's a very, very interesting period of time. And it may allow for rethinking, forced rethinking of the kind that we're trying to, working together and in part and many other people to really kind of say, what, what does this mean and where can we go? And experimentation and also politics, particularly at the state level and politics beginning to build up and maybe laying down the groundwork, in many of the New Deal programs were developed in the states and localities first. So I don't think nothing's changing. I think it's a hell of an interesting time and why the stuff is so urgent that we get, that we think this through. So that's just to respond on that, a little bit too long a response. Uh, I'm skeptical about Mondragon. In, in another, there's a voluntary relationships, and as you know, some of them have gone, some of the co-ops left and came back. So there are important efforts in Mondragon, but they are really dependent on the global market. They, they're not trying to get away from that. And moreover, they're not particularly ecologically interested in the environment. They're really good business for the Basques. But they've had this wonderful design of worker participation, worker control of the kind that you talk about within, and high efficiencies and great research techniques, and you know, in terms of returns to scale, but also Mondragon's got a really heavy duty research program. And why they do it, because they want to expand and they want to defend. That's the defense mechanism, which is really at the heart of it. So it isn't only re technical re returns to scale, it's putting big bucks, as Mondragon does, into research because that's the only way to protect yourself. That's my worry on that front. There was one other question here that I... Transition town. Transition town. Um, I, I think the transition towns are... I, I'm not a particular fan of the transition towns. I think they're on, but on the, they're on the cultural cutting edge. I think they're opening people's perspective for a small number and a vision that might translate into more practical things that my friends in I always, here's how I think about it, and I'll stop talking. You know, you get me going. Uh, I'm from Racine, Wisconsin. My question is, can I explain this to my conservative buddies from the high school in Racine, Wisconsin? And if I can't, that's my problem. And I think we've got to be able to do that. I don't think transition towns do it. I don't think they cut it. I think they're too far advanced. But they help us rethink what we want to do and translate into much more practical terms. That's how I think about it.
Okay, yeah. Uh, quick answer to your question about the allocation. Uh, I argue in the book that it's per capita as a prima facie obligation. So your, your, your natural right is your per capita share, but the national legislature can make exceptions. You can say, well, this part of the country really is underdeveloped. We, but it's quite clear if you give more to that part, there'll be less for the rest. It's also clear this isn't going to be permanent until you get back on your feet and so on and so forth. So I just want to say everyone ha has a sense. You get your fair share, you know. Uh, you can make the case that you deserve more than your per capita, but, you yeah. uh, The issue of the, the time that we're in, I mean, I absolutely agree. This is an astonishing period of time. Uh, and as I alluded to in my talk, I think in a way the United States and Europe really got lucky during the 20th century. Uh, you got lucky because these technologies and these wars came along, which worked against the kind of analysis that Marx had about you know, how this instability is going to get worse and worse and you're going to get a crisis. And I think a symptom of that, Michael Lerner, uh, the editor of Tikkun magazine you know, for spiritual progressives, had a really interesting article recently where he talked about the capitalist class usually having you know, a rational sector. You know, the rational sector were the ones that did look out for the system as a whole, were willing to make concessions, were willing to let unions organize again, you know, in part because you had the threat of communism and so on. You had to do something, generate these welfare uh, programs and so on. His argument is the rational capitalists have become completely demoralized because they don't see any way of solving these problems. They don't see, you know, any nice fixes that you can have. So you just step away and let the crazies, you know, run the show and more and more you just, you know, look out for yourself and your group and so on and so forth because you don't have any answers. You know, I think that's that's why we really are, you know, in a really Absolutely. fundamental different. The fascism threat, I think you've got to worry about that, but also remember the fascists didn't have any solutions. I mean, but the solutions they had were Keynesian solutions, you know, let's get a war going and so on and so forth, put people back. You know, but we've done all of that, you know, and that's run out of steam. So I don't know. Yeah, I think we really are in a, in a yeah. really crucial moment in history. One quick thing about Mondragon, and you're worried about uh, econo uh, expansion and so on. I mean, my argument, First of all, Mondragon is the, oh, there's thousands and thousands of democratic firms around. There's only one that has the size of a multinational corporation, okay? And they, they do want to expand, but, but expansion, remember, in Mondragon, it's protection. You're wanting to expand employment in the Basque region. It's not make as much money as possible for our shareholders. So to the extent they feel they've got to do this, you know, I mean, but again, it's an interesting to see a different set of priorities here and to see a really complicated, sophisticated organization where there aren't any capitalists, there aren't any shareholders, there aren't any capitalists, even capitalist entrepreneurs and so on. So I think it's a world historic experiment, but I agree, you know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't see itself as changing the world, you know, but what it is showing as possible, I think is vitally important. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, but it isn't this defensive aggression is the problem that, but I, I, one brief thing, you had asked about the regions. Canadian regions. Uh, I think that some of the Canadian regions are very interesting in what they've done in, in trying to change the social economy. And I think some of that can be built up and developed. It's, a, it's essentially with what you probably get in these different models, that's a kind of social democratic plus social economy possibility. That's a possibility if you can put the politics of that together. It's still a capitalist market, but that is a much more, it's, it's a much better model than what we're going through right now. But what's really interesting about the moment, and kind of here, so here we're talking to all you guys in this room, time to come up with really clarity about this so we can talk to folks. If anything like what we're talking about, the context is halfway right, these questions are very important to sort out so that we can talk to people and what do, we, what do you want? And if you don't know what you want, why should we listen to you? I mean, what the hell are you talking about? Where do you want to go? You don't know? I got somebody, I want to talk to somebody else. In this moment, most of the time, we haven't had that in the 20th century. 